Today we're going to talk about engineering tomorrow, what exactly that means. And we're going to talk about the world we live in today, where it's going, and how we can be a part of what the future holds. And to kind of set the tone of what kind of amazing place we live in today, I want to draw your attention to um, a piece of technology that's come out of the University of Washington in the fall of 2013. It's the first documented episode of mind control. And so what these researchers did was the first one sat in a lab across, on one side of campus and he had something called an EEG machine attached to his head. And this cap could read his brain waves. And on the other side of campus, his partner had a second machine strapped to his head called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so basically you have an input and an output setting. The EEG reads brain waves, interprets what that means, and then sends that signal across campus to the TMS and, can, and turns that into an effector. And so person A thought about moving his finger to hit spacebar to fire a missile in a video, video game. The EEG machine trans, uh, transcribed that and sent that across campus and without even wanting to or thinking about it, the TMS machine changed that into an output and forced the subject to hit the space bar and fire a missile. And this was last year. So this is the first time in history that we've actually, things that have come from science fiction have been transcribed into reality. Um, and this is just one example of one of the pieces of technology we're going to be looking at today. And so I just want to, want, want to use that example to set the tone for today because this is a time where anything and anywhere, anything is possible anywhere and anyone has the potential to do it. So if anything, to, what I want you to walk away with today is three concepts, three theses. It's an amazing time to be alive. This right now, 2015, is the age of discovery and there's never been a better time to create. If there's, if there's anything else you get out of this class, that's it. If you wanna go for a bike ride in your minds for the rest of this hour and 20 minutes, go for it, as long as you take that away with you. So today we're gonna to talk about how we get from here to there. How do we get from these pie in the sky ideas to turning them into reality? And how do we engineer the culture that brings us there? And so one thesis I want to begin with is there's potential in everything and everyone. And to show you exactly what I mean, I want to point you to uh, one of my favorite examples. It's called Makey Makey, and it uh, comes out of the MIT Media Lab. There you go. There's potential in everything and everyone. Your banana is your keyboard. Your high five is your synthesizer. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through today's lecture. We've talked a little bit about what we're going to talk about, but who am I? Who, who is this strange person telling you what exactly the future is going to hold? So let's introduce ourselves, and I also want to know who you are. So a little bit about myself in a second, but first let's grab the mic, and I want to know who you are, what you're studying, why you're here, and what you hope to get out of this. And if at any point during today's lecture you have questions, comments, concerns, you want to side rail what we're talking about and start a discussion, go for it. We're here to disrupt. So uh, we can start wherever the mic is right now and uh, start with your name, what you're studying, and why you're here. OK, I guess I get to go first. Um, my name is Kira. I'm in my fourth year um, studying major bio sci, minor in English, which is kind of a different combination. Um, and I'm here because I've heard a lot of really good things about this course. And I know there's nothing really offered quite like it. And I'm hoping to kind of open my mind to kind of what's out there and uh, exposed myself to new technologies and kind of promise and revitalize my optimism a little bit, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm, a, I'm Anchor. I'm a fourth year in neuroscience, a third year in neuroscience. <laughs> uh, I'm here because I've always wanted a course where there is no exams, simply because I think courses with exams teach purely towards the exam, and as much as you try to avoid it, everyone just learns whatever they can to pass the exam, and then it 
pretty much disappears afterwards. So I thought I'd take a course out of personal interest and where I can learn for the sake of learning rather than learning to pass an exam. So. My name is Michael. I'm in my second year of my master's degree in transplant immunology in the Department of Medicine. And I'm here because it sounds like cool beans. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Yen. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the Department of Surgery. It's my first year. Uh, I'm studying the uh, meniscus cells engineering. Um, I'm here I would, because I want to learn, uh, just exposed to something new. Uh, of the medicine. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Wen Jing. I'm, I'm the same as Yan. We are the classmate. And we pursued masters in the same university in China, in Santo University. Wow. And my major used to be in general surgery. I'm a surgeon in China and I come here also for PhD in surgery department. And it's my first year here. My research is surgical simulation in a uh, surgical simulation lab. So it's correlated with surgical innovation and it's, um, some, t it is some degree of surgical innovation of new tools. And so the future of medicine, this topic is, I'm very interested. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Rahel, and I'm in my undergrad in neuroscience, and I'm here because I want to learn more about the future, and I want to be prepared for the future, and technology and the future of medicine seems like a great course, and I've heard really amazing reviews, so excited to be here. Hi, my name is Francesco. I have a background in biomedical engineering, uh, both the bachelor and the master. And I came here to do my PhD in biophysics. Uh, in particular, I'm working in computer-aided drug design for cancer treatment. And uh, I decided to follow this course because, as you can understand from my background, I'm interested in new technology in health. And that's it. Perfect. So. Fair is fair, so you guys have introduced yourselves, um, so I'll introduce myself. So like some of you, I uh, completed my degree in neuroscience here. I'm currently a resident here, I've done my degree in medicine uh, also at the University of Alberta, trained in neurosurgery. I have also have a background in space research, space medicine, did my master's at the International Space University and worked at NASA for a bit. And then my background in entrepreneurship comes from a place called Singularity University, where uh, in answer to a challenge to positively impact 1 billion people in 10 years, we started a company based on disaster response. So a little bit about me, uh, happy to talk about any of that a little bit later on. Let's start with the first part of this lecture. I want to talk about transformation and what it takes to bring on a new technology or concept or a revolution and what the general formula is, if there is one, to get there. Um, so first I want to engage in a thought experiment. How many of you, by show of hands, were born in the 80s-ish? Anyone? 90s? Yeah? Okay, so think back to when you were a kid. Um, what was technology like then? What did you and did you not have? Go back to 1995. So this means you had no smartphone, maybe internet was creeping around, probably didn't check your email compulsively, Nintendo, maybe Super Nintendo was coming out, fax machine was probably the most efficient way to talk uh, or to communicate via distance. The world has changed a little bit since then. So I just want to draw your attention to this article. It's about a year old, but uh, it's a family in Guelph and I got a kick out of it. They live like it's 1986, the year that they were born in, because they found that their children were so attached, their two and their four-year-old were so attached to their iPad that they couldn't even get them to look up. And so they said, you know what, that's it. For a year, we're living like it's 1986. That means we are not using GPS on road trips. We are using road maps, which some people might not even know how to navigate these days. Uh, they used their microwave, that was it. They refused to look at family pictures on people's phones because that was cheating. They got all their film developed at the 24-hour uh, photo lab. And so in the space of 20 years, 
since 1995. The world has changed dramatically and almost exponentially, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But I just want to give you an idea of the pace at which the world has changed in 20 years. So let's go back a little bit further in time. Who is that and what, what is that beside him? Edison? Yeah, it's Thomas Edison and that's the light bulb yeah, behind him. And so the reason I wanted to talk about the light bulb is because it's a common misconception that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. In fact, if you look into the history of it, if you go to something as simple as Wikipedia, you'll find it was a process that lasted nearly a century and there were 22 inventors, co-inventors and contemporaries of the light bulb starting in 1802, starting with Humphrey Davy. There was a whole swath of inventors in Europe, in Russia, in the US, filing patents at the same time, experimenting with platinum, platinum tungsten, carbon, trying to find the most efficient way uh, and to, um, of, of keeping a light bulb burning, but also finding one that would work with, uh, work with burning for a long time and also working with what, what infrastructure was available to them. So Thomas Edison wasn't working in a vacuum. He built on successors of inventors who came before him. And the reason he was successful is because he built on the ideas of others. And more than that, he found his place in the infrastructure. He didn't just come up with a light bulb that managed to burn longer than most other uh, models out there. He created a system, an infrastructure, delivery system consisting of a uh, generator, a uh, delivery system, and um, a circuit that operated in parallel. So it wasn't just that people didn't have light bulbs, but they had no electricity to generate to power those light bulbs. And so not only what he, what he his ultimate success came from uh, economic efficiency, as well as materials efficiency, as well as finding the place in the system and creating an infrastructure for the light bulb to exist in. This invention and this popularization has so changed the landscape of our planet that at night, we can see our entire planet lit up, and that's pretty impressive. So I want to talk about another invention right now that has also fundamentally changed the way we live. I want to just reiterate this. It's the same lesson as with the light bulb. Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile. He wasn't the first one to create the car or the very first automobile. He didn't wake up one day and say, why don't we have a four-wheeled carriage that's not horse-powered? Initial prototypes for the car had been around since the late 1600s, and people have been iterating on the concept and building on it. His innovation or his stroke of genius was to mass produce the car and do it more efficiently and uh, more cheaply. And so the lesson here is that he looked at what was being done, he knew his landscape inside out, and then he thought, what process can I use to build on the ideas of others? Uh, and what, what is needed to mass popularize this. So the other lesson I wanted to point out here is that these, these inventions that have transformed the way we live, they've become such a part of our landscape that we don't even think about them. We don't look outside, we don't step outside and then when we're waiting to cross the street to stand in shock and awe and marvel and say, oh my goodness, what is this automated horse that's Tra traversing the, the road. We don't, we don't say, how is it that we're able to read late into the night, or how is it that we're able to exist as a 24-7 society uh, be living beyond the, sun, the rise and set, setting of the sun? So I want to turn things over to you now and ask you, what technologies, what other technologies do we have in our society today that seem to we take for granted, but that really have fundamentally changed the way we live. Can okay, anyone think of any examples? Just yell them out. The and internet. Internet, yeah, perfect. Anything you're addicted to that you have to check compulsively 500 times a day? Smartphones, yeah, exactly. Central heating. Central heating, I was actually just thinking that, especially on a day like this, people wouldn't even be able to live in Canada. Um, I know I barely do. <laughs> Uh, because um, 
of central heating and because of indoor um, heating and plumbing. And so here's just another uh, slide just summarizing some of the examples that we live with today. Vaccinations, hand washing, general anesthesia, moving outside of medicine. We talked about central heating, computers, smartphones, internet. And some of these are high-tech solutions, some of them aren't. Hand washing was someone simply saying, you know, I seem to notice that babies die when we deliver them, but uh, with an incredibly high mortality rate, it was, you know, up to 50% in some cases. And then someone said, well, what if we just practiced hand washing? And at the time, it was this crazy idea that people didn't believe in that, um, uh, that you know, was seen as inefficient, time waster, um, However, when it was finally rigorously studied and someone said, here's the results of what happens when you wash your hands and how, when you don't, and here's the survival rate of uh, babies in delivery rooms and hospitals, this is, um, you can't ignore the proof, it's irrefutable. And so I want to switch tracks now and I want to talk about um, science fiction coming alive. Did anyone here ever watch Inspector Gadget when they were a kid? Anyone? Yeah? So what, what kind of in inventions came from that show, do you think, that uh, didn't exist back then? What about uh, Get Smart? Did anyone watch that show? No? I'm dating myself here. So I want to talk about some of my favorite uh, science fiction uh, novels and stories that influenced me growing up. And so, has anyone here read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yes. <laughs> I saw I heard an emphatic uh, fist pump in the back. And so, this is the era that I grew up in, in the era of computer books from Inspector Gadget and, uh, and the handheld Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that supposedly held all the answers and could translate anything, or uh, Smartwatch from uh, Get Smart, or um, from a book that I really liked when I was a kid called My Teacher Flunked the Planet, and there was a handheld device called a URAT, a universal reader and translator. At the time, you know, in the early 90s, these things like, it seemed like things that, you know, were fantastic pieces of uh, uh, creation and innovation that, you know, maybe someday would exist. And then all of a sudden you pause and you look at where we are today and you hold up your smartphone and these devices have more computing power, more processing power than even science fiction could imagine 20 years ago. Um, one of my favorites, which hasn't come to device yet, or hasn't come to be realized yet. Has anyone seen the movie Her? Watch the trailer, <laughs> close enough. And so, what happens when we develop AI, artificial intelligence, that, that is powerful enough to simulate human personality? And what happens when they start replacing our social interaction and possibly even romantic connections? It's a very real possibility that's becoming even more realistic each day. Um, so let's move into technologies that, you know, seem futuristic, but are being developed as we very speak. Who here's a Back to the Future fan? Yeah, Kiris. So it's 2050 now, where's my hoverboard? Well, here it is. So that's uh, Marty McFly and astronaut Buzz Aldrin hanging out at Autodesk, floating on a hoverboard prototype. So I just want to take you through this video. And so that's just a prototype and obviously you don't want to push Buzz Aldrin over and break, you know, break your bone because that would be considered poor form. Poor form. But um, that's the uh, first prototype of the uh, uh, hover desk that's being, uh, sorry, uh, hover board that's being developed. And uh, if you're interested in owning your own Hoverboard, you can do that today. You can head over to Kickstarter and uh, offer to fund it and receive one of the first working prototypes. So let's talk about some other technologies that exist that are changing the world we live in. So analogous to printing, 2D printing. You put in your, your model uh, or pixels on your computer and you transmit that information to your printer, then it becomes a hard copy on paper. So what if you could do that for 3D models, and instead of being limited to paper, you could use any source material. You could use food uh, if you want to 3D print your own dessert, or you could, uh, if you wanted to uh, build organs or uh, tissues, you could input your own cells. 
or if you wanted to um, engineer the atoms themselves? What if you could uh, take two, two hydrogen models, mo molecules and one oxygen molecule and slam them together and create water? That's the more extreme case scenario, but that's where this technology is heading. What if you could do that and overcome scarcity, not having to worry about water or food sh shortages again? So this is the power of 3D printing. And um, some of the use cases, so we talked about 3D pr printing for organs. It's being used in art now. One of the most uh, creative examples of 3D printing for art I've heard is that uh, a human sneezed, and then they modeled the projectile of its sneeze and all the particles, and then they froze it and inputted that model into a computer, and then input, inputted that into a plastic model, and they printed a sneeze and made a vase out of it, which is disgusting yet creative. Um, in a more practical use case, what if you could 3D print houses? What if you could overcome uh, problems of cost, of of materials, of um, the time it takes to build an abode. And so um, one case I like to point to is called Akasa, where the uh, research, initial research at least, said that for 70% uh, less cost, less time, and using locally sourced materials, whether it's adobe or clay or soil, uh, you can print, a, uh, 3D print a house. And so all of a sudden, people who are homeless, living in uh, unstructurally, structurally unsound houses with only tarps over the head, have a hope of living in an actual domicile. And so how far has this technology been taken? This is an example coming out of Vienna, Austria, out of a physics lab there, where they've taken 3D printing to the atomic scale. And this, this cathedral you see here is made out of iron molecules, I believe, where they've manipulated the atoms and themselves to create what is probably the world's tiniest cathedral. So that's yesterday's news, though. What about 4D printing? What, was that, what would that look like? Is that even a thing? Apparently it is. So at MIT, Media Lab, or at MIT Research Labs, um, they're working on this concept. And so what is 4D printing? It's 3D printing over time. What happens when you take a sheet of paper and you soak it up, soak it with water? It loses its form, it changes shape. Now what if you could predict what kind of form it would take? What if you, what if the um, just add water concepts of food and uh, fuel and shelter from science fiction was true. What if you could just add a drop or two of water to a capsule and all of a sudden your fully, fully delivered meal is there? And so that's what 4D printing is. It's creating a 3D printed model that predicts in a specific, that behaves in a specifically predicted way to um, create a model that will, create, that will adjust to air or water, whatever your medium is. And so that's taking it one step further. And now there's whisperings of 5D, 5D printing, whatever that is. And so it's not that we're just living in the future, but it's evolving at this pace that we're constant, that's constantly changing. And we need to, how do we keep up with that? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that later in this course, or later in this lecture. So I want to switch tracks now and talk about the future of transportation. Who here has ever been stuck in a traffic jam? Everyone. Who here has wished that they could overcome it? You know, maybe just fly above the traffic. It's 2015 now. Where's our flying cars? Well, here they are. So this company is called Terrafugia, and they are the first FAA-approved company to have a hybrid car plane that drives as easily on the highways and when it's time to take off, can uh, take off as a glider and is classified as a personal glider. So if you want to look that company up, it's called Terrafugia. But um, the uh, first clearance has been given, and prototypes are already on the way for later this year. So since this is a course about technology and the future of medicine, I want to switch over to prostheses now. What I want to say about prostheses is that we've come a long way. 
for many, for war veterans, for amputees, for those who've suffered the loss of a limb, their only resort used to be either a hook, which barely replicates the functionality of a human hand, which 11 degrees of motion. Everyone, I just want you to take your hand right now and just practice moving it, you know, up, down, side to side, roll it, then take your fingers and bend them. 11 degrees of motion. A hook doesn't come anywhere near that. And so when DARPA first started their uh, prosthetics challenge in 2006, they said, you know, war veterans are being maimed and injured and disfigured for a country. You know, we should do better than a hook. And eventually this is what they came up with. From hooks to replicating 11 degrees of motion, and more than that, being able to get a sense of haptic feedback. So knowing how much pressure to put in your grip, whether you're holding an iron bar or an un unboiled egg. And that's not all that's evolved in the field of prosthetics. Out of Berkeley, California comes the human exoskeleton. So those who've been paralyzed or paraplegic now have the option of strapping on a 100 pound uh, exoskeleton that's uh, weight distributed uh, through a backpack and throughout the legs. And so now those who've been previously wheelchair con confined um, are able to walk. And if you've ever seen this demonstration live, seeing a paraplegic walk for the first time is incredibly moving and incredibly uh, innovative. Um, and uh, you'll have access to these uh, slides after the, the uh, presentation, so if you want to look more into that later. So let's switch tracks now and talk about materials science. I want to tell you about aerogel. So this is called frozen smoke because it is the world's lowest density material, pretty much all air, 96% air. And when you look at it, it's this hazy kind of film that you can barely see with the texture of styrofoam. But the beauty of this is that while lightweight, it's incredibly strong. And so if you squint at the screen there, you can see that this brick is actually standing on aerogel. And so what kind of applications do you see for something that's like this, that's, that's strong and yet incredibly lightweight? What about for aviation or for space where the price is incredibly high, it's 10,000 pounds per kilo to send this something into air, low Earth orbit, where, um, or in aviation where anyone who's ever had a bag that's over the weight limit knows that uh, uh, lightweight is better. I want to talk about trends now. This is a course on entrepreneurship, technology, and the future of medicine. So we've already talked about 3D printing and its applications for cell development, tissue development, organ development. Some other technologies I want to draw your attention to, big data, geolocation, the trend of faster, better, cheaper, smaller, nanomedicine, artificial intelligence, what's referred to as the 4P system in the United States. It's in a concept put forth by their uh, National Institute of Health. So referring to medicine as increasingly personalized, preventative, participatory, and predictive. And then uh, looking at the trend of antibiotics and increasing resistance. Um, we're gonna focus on two of these now and uh, look at them as case studies. Antibiotic resistance. The golden era of antibiotic development was the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and the majority of what we have in terms of antibiotics today in penicillins, vancomycin, came out of that era. Unfortunately, what's happened in that time over these decades through overprescription, overuse, natural mutation, and then specifically selecting out bacterial populations is that bacteria have evolved to become increasingly resistant so what was once an easy cure for, for a strep throat infection, penicillin, isn't effective anymore. That means we have to go from our first line treatment to our second line treatment, meaning that we have to look at drugs that are increasingly big gun, that are increasingly broad spectrum, that are increasingly hard to find, and increasingly expensive. Or it means that the risk to benefit ratio of what drugs we have to deliver now to get the intended response 
come with a bigger side effect profile. Unfortunately, the research um, and the drug development of new antibiotics hasn't kept pace with the, with the rate of antibiotic or bacterial resistance. We're actually currently now in a crisis, in a public health crisis, and the World Health Organization has this to say. They're saying that antibiotic resistance is happening right now in every region of the world and has the potential to affect anyone, any age, any country, and is now a major threat to public health. And this is terrifying because what was once easily treated is um, with medication, with antibiotics, isn't. Uh, and to give you an idea of how quickly this is evolving and how quickly we're changing uh, and how quickly we're being outpaced by and outsmarted even by bacteria, what was considered a first line drug when I when, we, when I went through with medical school in 2011, 2012, has been replaced. Each year, I'm becoming familiar with new drugs being taught by our hospital pharmacists that uh, this isn't first line anymore because it's not available, because it's not effective, or, or because uh, it's simply too expensive now. Um, and so for those of you who are looking for the next big thing or looking for an area to read more about or, you know, looking for a challenge to take on. This is a holy grail right here. For those of you who are paying attention to the news, yesterday um, out of Northeast University in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, for the first time in decades since 1987, a new drug, new drugs classes have not been introduced into the hospital. And this team out of Northeast University uh, introduced what they call Taxobactin. And it, they, by targeting uh, the lipid molecules in cell walls, they're able to uh, create a new class of drugs uh, and a new mechanism of action. I want to take you over to another case study now. So big data refers to the science of processing very large data sets, often thought of as a 4V model. So looking at data in terms of variety, volume, veracity, and velocity. So what does that mean? It means that we have data in many, many forms. To give you an example, I want to take you, take you through a thought experiment right now. Think of what it means to be a human. Essentially, you are just a complex sensory processing machine. I read somewhere that every second of human experience is equal to 40 terabytes of processing per second. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that in this very second, as you're listening to me, you're hearing my voice, you're seeing me, seeing me, you're feeling the pressure of the floor on your feet, the pressure of the chair against your back, but you're also hearing the subtleties, you're hearing the background noise outside in the hallway, you're hearing the undulations in my voice, you're seeing the modulation of light on the screen, on my face, 40 terabytes each second couple gigabytes of that of which you retain, sadly. And so our ability to hold on to this data, to parse this data, is becoming increasingly refined. This is what big data refers to. And it also refers to the forms in which data comes. Text, audio, video, GIFs, RFID, software backgrounds. But what is, the, what is our need? How do we parse this data? This is volumes of data. The world's capacity to store data has doubled every 40 months since 1980. Every day in the past two years, we've generated 2.5 exabytes. So that's 10 to the 18th power. Um, and what's considered big data today might not even be a drop in the bucket in five, 10 years. Um, when I had my first computer in the mid 90s, uh, we had four megabytes of RAM, and holy cow, that was a big deal. And then as we downloaded more songs onto our computer and we loaded more applications onto our computer, we started to run out of memory. And I remember in 1997, the sales rep said, with this one gigabyte upgrade, you will never need to upgrade your computer again. I see people laughing because we all know what one gigabyte is worth these days. 
And so with this increasing amount of data comes the need to store it, to parse it, to mine it, and to apply it. Because once you see patterns amongst uh, rivers and oceans of data, you can use it to figure out how internet's being used, how to make search better, to parse vast amounts of data. So in astronomy, uh, the, you can use it to, for uh, astronom astronomical search. In the past five years alone, we've doubled the amount of planets we've been able to find since 1994. Um, you can use it for finance, predicting the behavior of uh, stock markets, and in genomics to uh, better parse the human genome. To give an example of what exactly the amount of data we're talking about, let's look at the example of the Large Hadron Collider over at CERN. So the LHC is made up of 150 million sensors delivering 40 million data points on 600 million collisions every second. So unfiltered, this is 500 exabytes. So we're talking to the 20th power of 10 every day. So this is 200 times every single other data source on this Earth combined. So almost unfilterable amounts of data. If it weren't filtered, there would be no relevance to this data whatsoever. And by taking only one ten thousandth of a percent and filtering 99.999% of this data, they managed to make this data manageable, parsable, and come down to a mere 100 collisions a second. This is still 25 petabytes of data every year, but far more manageable, I think you'll agree, than the 150 million petabytes of uh, data uh, that would otherwise need to be parsed. It's a six million fold difference. And so the reason I talk to you about big data, about antibiotic resistance, um, about uh, new trends in medicine, is because the world is changing faster and faster. We're on a treadmill that's going faster and faster every minute we're on it, but it's not increasing from one mile to two miles to three miles. It's going from one mile to two miles to four miles every single minute. And we need to learn to adapt and change in this world, and we need to learn to think exponentially. I want to take you through a thought experiment right now. My first question to you is, what are some jobs that did not exist 10 years ago? Feel free to just yell them out. Sure, go ahead. Say again. Uh, huge jobs in gaming. Huge jobs in gaming. In gaming, yeah, absolutely. Gaming has changed phenomenally. So anyone here who watched Star Trek as a kid might uh, think back to the Hollow Deck and how perfectly uh, simulations were made up. So. That, think about that 40 terabyte per second example I told you about of what it means to be human. And that was perfectly replicated in the holodeck in terms of feel, sense, uh, or sensation, uh, auditory, visuals. Um, and now think about that in the context of gaming. Because when the first Nintendo, the first Atari system came out, it was an 8-bit gaming system and just viewed as a diversion. And suddenly that changed into the Nin Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, then the PlayStation the, came out, uh, the Xbox came out. Now we have things like the Wii and the Kinect. And now we're not just sitting with a game controller, but this have, these things have become whole body experiments and excursions. Suddenly you are using your entire body to interact with your gaming system. And at this rate, it won't be very long before we have increasingly real simulations of gaming. What, can anyone think of any other examples of jobs that didn't exist in the past few years, past 10 years? What about app development? Go ahead, you were saying? Yeah, I'm just thinking about one that isn't necessarily a new job that was created, but a transition from one type of job to another. I'm thinking about the transition from traditional animation in firms like Disney to computer-generated graphics in DreamWorks. So you have very few people that are traditional animators now, but there's a huge market for people with a background in CGI. Yeah, that's a great example. And if you look at things like, you know, 
I think many of us who were around um, who saw the first few Star Wars movies, so episodes four, five, six, this was an era before any of that CGI, before you know, we had uh, you know, advanced, advanced green screens. And now you look at uh, the quality of uh, animation in uh, the latest Pixar film and the motion, the ability uh, to replicate human facial features uh, and movements and look at uh, replicate light or flames is very impressive. Uh, that's a great example. Anyone else? So my other question to you that is, what are jobs that will exist in 10 years time, five years time, 20 years time? Jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. App developer, what would you develop an app on? There were no smartphones. We talked about big da data, so data miners, data analysts, never were around. Now you can get your degree in data science. A millennial generational expert, I still don't believe this is a real thing, but apparently it is. So anyone born from the year 1980 to the early 2000s is deemed a millennial, and we are our own specific breed of, of species, apparently, that needs a, a millennial gener generational expert to figure out what motivates us, figure out what makes us tick, figure out how we, how we differ from generations that came before us. <coughs> Social media manager, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, these things didn't exist. Cloud computing services. In 2009, people were still like, cloud computing, do you mean things up in the sky? And now the term cloud computing is household because it's where we store our music, our pictures, our, it's where we share our files on Dropbox, on, on the iCloud. It's an increasingly expanding field because the need to store personal data, business data, to, uh, is growing exponentially. Digital marketing managers never existed. If you ever happen to catch a clip of a sports game, say in 1980, Miracle on Ice, um, Canada versus, uh, or sorry, uh, the Russian hockey game, you'll notice that uh, there were no sponsorship ads on a, uh, and any of the games uh, in the 80s, whether it's NBA, um, NHL. And then you watch how marketing has changed in the 20, 30 years since then. Suddenly ads became more prominent. They became, on the, they became present on the sideboards, on center ring, uh, up a, up in the on the scoreboard, and then yeah even sure. On the field, I guess. Sorry. Even on the field. Yeah, even on the field, on the jerseys, on uh, NASCAR, you can't even see the car itself because it's covered in logos. And then that came, then came the internet age, and uh, it became uh, part of the the co web content. It became part of the the apps that came with the with sports, sporting teams, sporting events. Uh, and digital marketing became a field. Search engine optimization wasn't a thing before Google. User interface design, user experience design, uh, experts weren't a thing. And sustainability managers, because we never thought we would run out of resources. We never thought uh, we would need to think about uh, being green or that uh, corporate corporations would need a strategy on, on becoming environmentally or socially, socially responsible. So that's the past. Now let's look towards the future. We talked about big data. What about waste data? Because as we saw from the Large Hadron Collider example, only 0.0001% of data is usable. So what do you do with all that other junk waste? Look at the example of genomics. We're primarily junk DNA. We're more junk than we are human. So what do we do with that extra data? Is that to say that we need a place to dump it or that we should save it for later and hope that future generations have a use for it. Augmented reality, people have been trying to make this a thing for decades now. You know, every few years it has its resurgence and people say this is the year, I remember 2009 people were saying this is the year that augmented reality will be a thing and then it kind of went on its way and then with the advent of Google Glass, virtual augmented reality became a thing again. And so, when virtual reality finally has its heyday, who will be the architects of that? What will be the applications of that? You know, will we have GPS flash across our windshields and give us on windshield interactions? 
will Google Glass be augmented to Google contact lenses? And will we you know, have step-by-step -step instructions to our next class, to our next appointment? What about alternative currencies? You know, we've went from dealing in national currencies and then in the late 90s, the euro was created and we had a continental currency and now we're dealing in, in online currencies, in Bitcoin. And what happens when we transcend the need for currencies altogether? What happens if we trade purely in energy or things that don't have monetary value? What happens if we say our value is where, is where our intellect lies or our creativity lies? Um, and how do, we, how do we mitigate that and how do we value that? We talked about 3D printing. What about being a 3D printing engineer? Um, privacy managers. No one ever used to think about that. And now, you know, what is privacy? Because no one needs to ask your permission to post your picture on Facebook, to say that they were with you, to say, um, to say who, where you were on a specific date. And the debate is still open. Should they or shouldn't they? Um, octogenarian service providers, you know, life, life expectancies are becoming longer and longer and we need to figure out a way to, as we change our diseases from acute to chronic, as, as diabetes, as high blood pressure, as congestive heart failure, take over our healthcare system, how do we manage these? How do we keep octogenarians healthy octogenarians? Um, extinction revivalists. What about dr making Jurassic Park a reality? Personally, I find that a little bit terrifying, but maybe some people want a pet velociraptor, who knows? And then my favorite, because I never saw the need until uh, I became, I came onto the other side of healthcare. So what about a healthcare navigator? Uh, as a do doctor, I know exactly what questions to ask. When I see my patients um, who have been in the hospital long term, I know to ask about their, their daily uh, sense, how they're feeling that day, but I need also know to ask about their progress, their rehabilitation, uh, their physical rehabilitation, uh, their nutrition, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. I know to ask all about all those things. And then suddenly a few months ago, I found my uncle in the hospital and I went along with my cousin as well as my parents to visit him and I was the translator between the doctor and my family and that was after 20 plus years of schooling. It shouldn't take decades of schooling to navigate the healthcare system but it does um, because we've gone from what existed as 10 subspecialties of medicine to over 150 subspecialties of medicine that's increasingly evolving. Uh, now you're suddenly not just uh, a primary care doctor. You're a primary care doctor with a specialization in, in palliative services or geriatric services. You're not just a neurosurgeon anymore. You're a pediatric neurosurgeon with a specialization in vascular disease, for example. And so as the bridge between patient and general population uh, spans over here, and the doctors are far over here as they become increasingly specialized, we will need navigators to help bridge that gap. Otherwise, medicine will become an increasingly foreign language. So in the last minutes of this class, we have about 10, 15 minutes left to us. I want us to bring everything back and talk about how we get from here, today, in this era, world that's consistently changing, to there, to this future that has so much potential with flying cars and big data and 3D printed organs. Um, I want to talk to you about the lessons I've learned through my own uh, navigation with the healthcare system, having run a startup, having uh, built a company. Um, and then I want to see what pearls that you have to add to that or what questions you might have. First lesson, lesson zero. This comes back to the example of the, land, of the light bulb and the car. Know your landscape. When you're trying to introduce an innovation into a system, you can't come 
You can't wake up and say, okay, I think this should be a thing. I think this is the year that augmented reality will happen. Or I think that this is the year that, uh, you know, we finally make FaceTime the only method of phoning someone. Where does your idea fit into the current system? And is the time right for it? And what concept does it build on? You know, if your idea is the light bulb of, the, of this generation, then what other light bulbs came before it, whether the cars came before it. Um, look at a more modern example. Video chat has been around since the 1970s. Anyone who watched the Jetsons growing up, um, apparently that was the way of the future. We only communicated by video phones. It's 2015. We have the option of doing it with Skype. We have the option of doing it via FaceTime, but it's still not the norm. And it took decades, it took 40 years for video chat to finally be popularized. So when you look at an innovation, do yourself the favor if it, of looking at the context and saying, is it the time right to bring this to market? Is what is the resistance versus the ease of bringing this into reality? You know, if, if there's to be backlash against a particular concept, um, what, uh, what might be the reasons for that? My favorite lesson is don't be limited by reality. You can dream it, you can do it. Nothing is too impossible, nothing is big. So we have people, we have, uh, people training in biomedical engineering, in uh, neuroscience, in uh, general surgery here. And so as a thought experiment, I want you to ask yourselves, what is the biggest innovation or the biggest revolution that could change your field? Is it being able to 3D print an organ? Is it being able to do scalpelless surgery? Uh, is it uh, an innovation in uh, materials design? Um, that's one of the things I want you to go home and think about today. As you walk out of here today, I want you to take on the mindset of questioning everything and asking why something has to be the way it is. You know, why does this room have to be the way it is? Is it the most ergonomically designed as it could be? Are these chairs the most conducive to your being able to interact with me, to being able to adjust to your comfort? Is the lighting in this room as it could be? And if not, how could you make it better? How could you build on the design of this room in terms of comfort, temperature, interactive, interactivity, ergonomics? Look at, the mecha, look at the mundane, the everyday, and question it. And I call this the ketchup bottle problem because you look at the traditional ketchup bottle, completely inefficient. The very design of this product is mind-boggling because you can't access the full amount of product. And so for years and years I had ranted about this because it's useless. And then someone did me one better and uh, said, well, why don't we just redesign the uh, ketchup bottle? And the MIT Media Lab came up with this. And so here's your traditional ketchup bottle. By very design of the product, it will stick to the inside of the bottle, not allowing you to access the product. So what if you re-engineered the surface so there's no cohesion, less cohesion between the ketchup and the bottle? and voila, all of a sudden you can access the full amount of the product. So I want you to take this ketchup bottle mentality and apply it to the world around you. And so as we change our mentalities and we change our mindsets, I don't want you to think of this as a world full of problems, but as a problem or, or crises, but as a, as a set, series of crisis I want you to look at things that aren't as optimal as they could be or things that are construed as major crises or problems today, and then see what is the opportunity to make it better, and say, well, what if we thought of this problem this day, this way? You know, what if we thought of disease as an opportunity to manage health better? What if we look at violence as uh, an opportunity to so look at social constructs in engineer society uh, in a more organized fashion. Um, and look at every challenge we face as not something that's 
a black mark or a dark cloud upon society, but a way to make ourselves better. Lesson number four, I want you to realize that, coming back to our initial thesis, that there's potential in everything and everyone. And I say this because I hear this so often that so many people are like, well, I'm just X, but I'm just an undergraduate student, or I'm just so ensconced in my current work and my current graduate work, or I'm so busy, or I don't have the skill set to do this, or I don't have the time to do this. Um, and just cast that off for a second. Ask yourself, what if for a second I didn't feel limited by my station or, or my, my job or my lack of skills? And I want to point you to this, these uh, two individuals on the screen. So up here in the corner, we have Jack Andraka. He's 18 now. When he was 15, he uh, had to come up with a science fair project. And he had a close family friend who died of pancreatic cancer. And when he looked into it, he realized that the problem with can pancreatic cancer detection is that by the time mesothelin was detected in uh, the gold standard test for cancer detection, it means the cancer spread far, far too um, much and it's a palliative situation. And so he said, what if we could do cancer detection better? And he slogged through over 4,000 academic papers and he contacted over 200 institutions of, uh, of uh, uh, oncology researchers in the US. And he said he got 199 rejections and one lukewarm maybe from Johns Hopkins. Um, and when he, and he presented his idea to them, he said, what if we could take carbon nanotubules and uh, antibodies to mesothelin and better um, and detect them in that fashion? And in, in putting forth this concept at the age of 15, he was able to create a pancreatic detection, um, pancreatic cancer detection mechanism that was as good as the gold standard, thousands of times cheaper and even faster, meaning that we can detect pancreatic cancer earlier and more cheaply and more quickly at 15. And the girl in the corner here, her name is Brittany Vanger. She won the Google Science Fair two years ago because at the age of 17, she said, what if we could do breast cancer detection better? What if we had an AI for that? What if we could use fine needle aspirate, which is one method of bi biopsy instead of core biopsies, making it less painful for the patient to detect um, uh, breast cancer? And what if we could learn from the results that we get and create an algorithm that uh, makes cancer detection more accurate the more samples we get? And based on that algorithm, uh, created a method that was 99.99% accurate um, using this fine needle aspirate, this less painful, less invasive method, um, making cancer detection less painful for the patient. 15 and 17. I know I wasn't doing that when I was a teenager, but the idea is that when you're, you, you can have excuses to do something or you can't, but um, if, you're having, if you have an idea, figure out what your excuses are, and then say, what if, for a day I didn't have those. And so, what if you don't have the skill set? What if you have an idea for a new app? Or what if you have an idea for a new innovation or a new material, but you don't have the skill set? You're not an engineer, or you're not a designer, or you're not a coder. Well, that's why there's seven billion people in the world. Find someone who, can, who you can work with because your best innovations won't come from locking yourself in a room and thinking something through until you've come up with the idea. But by bouncing ideas with someone from a different discipline who's been trained to think in a different way, the best ideas and the biggest breakthroughs come from the cross bridges of forging um, ideas between new disciplines. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist and a brain surgeon as well. Okay, I promised you we'd talk about thinking exponentially. And so let's look at the, the, the use case of mo social media and mass media. If you think exponentially, when the radio first came about, it took 38 years to reach 50 million people. By comparison, it took Facebook only two years to reach the same amount of people. This is what I mean by thinking exponentially. So as another thought experiment, if I were to ask you to take eight 
geometric steps across this room, you would be eight steps across this room. You take one step, then two steps, then three steps, then four. If you were to take eight geometric steps rather than arithmetic steps, you would be halfway to the moon. So let's take this thought experiment. You take one step, then two steps, then four steps, 16, 32, 64, all the way into the thousands. And so this goes back to the analogy of the treadmill I was talking about earlier. What happens if your treadmill is speeding up, not just at one mile a minute, but it's doubling its pace every minute? Because that's the rate at which technology is changing in the world. That's the rate at which our computational power is increasing. That's the rate at which we can, at which our rate of discovery is increasing. But what does that mean? And how do we keep our pace with our ability to keep up with that? And so, I don't know. That's why I'm not offering a solution. But if anyone has any ideas, I'm happy to hear them. We talked a little bit about new currencies and creation and creating and being uh, the value of being creative. So lesson number seven is practicing creative confidence. And that is the notion that you have big ideas and that you have the ability to act on them. Uh, this comes from uh, the founder of IDEA, which is a design firm. And I really like this idea because it kind of, it brings us into our next, uh, next lesson, design thinking. I practice this concept and I really enjoy it because it really gives you a chance to prototype and to turn your idea into reality. And so the concept laid out here is, what is your idea? And then who are you designing it for? And based on that, how are you going to redesign, reinvent, pro prototype? And then how, based on that, how will you come up with increasingly creative solutions? And that will lead you to your first prototype. And then you come back to your initial idea and for whom you're creating and for what you were creating. And then you have a sense of how you need to change, how you need to iterate, how you need to focus. And that's what design thinking is all about. Seeing problem space, finding out who and what you're designing for, and then creating, designing, making solely for that. Lesson nine. So this comes back to knowing your landscape. But the lesson here is know your history. To get to where you're going, you have to know how you got there. History is rife with lessons. Learn about the greats and learn about their mistakes. I have the examples of 12 Years a Slave and American History X here because when I made this slide, I was, I was in a social history kind of space. The thought that's always stands out to me today, if we're looking at problems to address and challenges to address, uh, is that more people now in this age, day and age, in 2015, 20 to 30 million people worldwide are enslaved. Um, that's more than at any other point in human history. So if you're looking for a big problem space to address or a big idea to address a major problem, that's one of them. Um, and if you look at the history of how, humans, uh, of how human slavery has led to inequality today, knowing your history really explains why we have racial inequ inequity, why there is such strife, in the world, in the U.S. in particular, it explains why you know there's uh, racial tension in places like Ferguson. Um, so we're deviating a little bit from technology, but the, exa the example and the point I want to make here is knowing what came before. Whether we're talking about the evolution of the light bulb or we're talking about social equity, explains a lot about our place in the world today, and explains about what next a lot about what your next move is. And lastly, lesson number 10, embrace the Nike philosophy. If there's something that is holding you back, just shut up and do it. So we're running out of time here today. So I just want to jump to our, my optional homework assignments for you. Of course, I'm not going to check up on this. But if you, you, know, if you feel at heart that you have, you're an innovator or a designer, or you just want to hone your skills on becoming a, a creator or an inventor, Here's some thought experiments I want you to engage in over the next few days and until our next class. So number one, see the world through new eyes. As you walk out of this class, look at it, look at it as, a as a challenge and ask, how can I make things better? You know, how can I make the, the flow of traffic from class to class better so there's no bottleneck uh, in quad? How can I make lecture halls more ergonomically friendly? And for one day, take a pad of paper and write down every inefficiency and every opportunity you see. Start thinking about grand challenges. 
What are the three biggest challenges within your own field? What are the greatest threats to humanity and progress today? You know, we've talked about a little bit about disease and antibiotic resistance. We talked about social problems. We talked about slavery. Being able to think exponentially and being outpaced by the evolution of uh, technology. And then my last homework assignment for you is pick an invention or inventor and learn about their evolution. What made, the, you know, what made the light bulb? What successes and failures were encountered along the way? So next time, we're going to put our money where our mouth is and we're going to go from idea to reality. So it's going to be all about thinking big, working in teams. It's going to be less of me and all of you. We're going to look at trends and technologies and create a company next class. What we're all here for today, three things I want you to walk out with today. It is an amazing time to be alive. This is the age of discovery and there's been never been a better time to create. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to you after class.